All right, y'all, we're going to try this again. This is Jackie Lukman broadcasting from Washington, D.C., and this is the second part of my discussion about Fidel Castro and Cuba and the truth behind the legacy of Fidel Castro, the history of U.S. involvement in Cuba. Uh, and hopefully I'm going to give you some information that you've never heard before. Uh, and I hope that helps you put not just Fidel Castro, but our the relationship of our government with Cuba and Fidel Castro into some context. Uh, thank you guys for joining. I apologize for the connection issues a few minutes ago. I've got a weird network and I think, you know, the woods behind the house just make things really difficult. Uh, and I got a bunch of stuff on this network too that I keep forgetting. Oh, I need to turn this, that, and the other thing off. Hey, Pat, thank you for checking in. Thank you so much. Hey, Kier, thanks for checking in. Thank you, Helen, for sharing the video already. Hi. Um, uh, again, this is Jackie Lukman. For those of you who are just joining, and this is the second part of our discussion about Fidel Castro and Cuba. So let's get into it, all right? Hey, Liza, thank you for that you enjoyed part one. I appreciate that. And thank you for coming back for part two. So yesterday we left off with Fidel Castro um, overthrowing uh, Fulgencio Batista. I think I practiced that name a couple of times today. Hi, Tara. Thank you uh, to make sure I, I at least got close to getting it right. Um, but uh, 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 Castro overthrew Batista in 1959, January 1, 1959. Happy New Year, right? Before that, it is important to know that the United States government knew about Castro and his band of rebels in the Sierra Madre Mountains. Uh, and they knew that Batista was a murderous tyrant. Remember I said yesterday that the United States government knew, hi Jimmy, uh, uh, Jamie, I'm sorry, Heather and Heidi, um, that the United States government knew by 1958 that uh, Batista had murdered around 20,000 Cubans in the seven years he was dictator. Okay, and, and Batista was a dictator. His first term, he was democratically elected in 1940. Uh, uh, um, but when he overthrew the, the guy before him, uh, that came after his first term, he made himself dictator. So this, this thing that people say, oh, I hate Castro because he was a dictator. Well, so was the guy before him. Um, so the United States knew that Batista was a murderer and that, they, and that he murdered 20,000, upwards of 20,000 Cubans because the United States gave Cuba the weaponry to do it. And uh, hi, Donna. And uh, uh, the, the United States was actually embarrassed by Batista's bloody reign. As a matter of fact, Castro, when he was educating peasants in the mountains, uh, one of his methods of educating the Cuban people was propaganda. Propaganda is just giving people information from a perspective that you want them to have. Propaganda can be negative and it can be positive, it depends. But Castro really didn't have to do a lot of propaganda when it came to Batista, because everybody knew he was a murderer, everybody in Cuba and most of the politicians in the United States. But, but Castro framed the discussion about Batista in ways that were catchy, that people would easily repeat and because they were easy to understand. Instead of telling, you know, going down this long list of Batista's crimes, of which there were many, what Castro said was that Batista's army's uniforms doubled as butcher's aprons. That's how many people they killed. That's Batista's reign was that bloody, that the army's uniforms doubled as butcher's aprons. Now that's catchy. That sticks in your mind. That's what propaganda is when it's used to educate people. Propaganda can also be used to mislead people. 
It's all in the hands of, of, of who is using it and what their intentions are. So, all right, let's get back to this because there, it's, it, there's, there's a very definite, definitive timeline of things that happened that led to uh, the relationship that the United States eventually had with Cuba for 50 years. So January 1, 1959, Castro overthrows the government uh, of Fulgencio Batista. Uh, but in 1958, it is very important to know that the United States actually imposed an arms embargo against the Batista government because they were so embarrassed by his murderous activities. Even after Batista gives uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, John Dulles, who an airport is named after this man in the Washington DC area today. Uh, Victor, if you missed part one, I'm gonna put a link to part one up uh, in, the, in the introduction of this video so you can go back and see it. Um, so the Secretary of State, John Dulles, accepts a solid gold telephone from the dictator in Cuba who he knows has murdered tens of thousands of people because he approved the arms sales to go to him to help him do it. So the United States, finally embarrassed after seven years by all of this horrible stuff, they implement, we implement an arms embargo against the Batista government. They do this knowing that Castro and Che Guevara are in the mountains amassing an army of peasants to overthrow the Batista government. Yes, the United States knew who Castro was, where he was, what he was doing. And they supported him. They supported him because Batista had embarrassed the United States by murdering all those Cuban people. So uh, when Castro overthrew Batista on January 1, 1959, the United States government actually supported Fidel Castro's revolution. I know there is no media outlet in America that will tell you that, but that is true. They also knew that Castro and his, his brother Raul had probably had some communist leanings. And remember I said yesterday that this, this fear of communism was almost palpable in the United States. But it wasn't so terrible that government, U.S. government officials didn't support Castro overthrowing Batista. See, we knew that Castro and his brother had communist, communist leanings and we didn't care because we were hoping that Castro's revolution would finally get rid of the murderous, the butcher Batista. I have notes, that's the, that's the noise you're hearing, me turning my pages and pages of notes because I, I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want you to think that this is Jackie Lukeman's opinion of Fidel Castro. I don't want you to think that this is Jackie Lukeman's opinion of Cuba. I, I want to make sure that I'm giving you information that is based in history. And I want to make sure I'm giving you as balanced a picture as I possibly can while making sure that I, I make clear that what we're told about Fidel Castro and about Cuba isn't entirely true. Some of it is true. And, and some of it that is true is completely out of historical context. That's my thing, historical context. I don't have a problem with my heroes having shady pasts. I just need to know why they did what they did. And this is one of those stories that explains a lot of things. So January 1, 1959, uh, uh, Castro and his revolution overthrows Batista. Batista, his family, and a lot of the cabinet flee Cuba. All right. In March of 1959, Castro takes over the International Telephone and Telegraph Company property and the Cuban Telephone Company. Why am I bringing that up? Why is that important? Well, I have to give you a little bit of history on the International 
telephone and telegraph company for you to understand why that's important. IT&T grew from a tiny bankrupt Puerto Rican telephone company. In 1917, when the United States purchased the Virgin Islands from Denmark for $30 million, the U.S. also gained the the Bell, the Ben, B-E-H-N, family as citizens. How weird is that? The brothers Ben, uh, Sosthenes and Hernand, caught on to the American capitalist system quickly. They began as sugar brokers in Puerto Rico and soon learned that the telephone was a wonderful business tool. They settled a bad debt for a bankrupt telephone company and they brought their phone innovation uh, to Cuba and Puerto Rico. So this is important because the International Telephone Company was charging poor Cubans and poor Puerto Ricans exorbitant amounts of money for telephone ownership and telephone use. And under the corrupt Batista government, the Cuban telephone company was doing the same thing. So it's significant that the first thing, the first thing Fidel Castro did when he took over the government was to take over the means of communication in Cuba. Now, I know you're thinking because he was a dictator, he was controlling what people listened to and he was tapping people's phones and he probably was, but I hope you'll be able to see that if he did that, there's no, there's no, there's nothing that I've dug up that I've in investigated that proves that he did that. But because he was the leader of a country, I wouldn't doubt it because our government taps our phones. So I don't, why wouldn't Fidel Castro do it? But he did it in order to stop private companies from extorting Cuban people. Because when he took over, when his government took over the ITT company and the Cuban telephone company, telephone rates were slashed in half. Then all of a sudden, everybody could afford a phone in Cuba. Everybody could afford to connect with the rest of the world. Imagine that. Hmm. So that was in uh, March. In May, this is extremely important. Oh, that's my hubby, Abdi Shahid Lukman. Hi, babe. Hi, everybody say hi to hubby. He said, all governments protect themselves from their enemies. He's absolutely right. So, so the point is, if Castro did take over the telecommunications companies to tap the phones of his citizens, that's nothing that any government that, that is serious about protecting itself from its enemies that are internal would has ever done. Like I said, we do it. And I'm not saying that is right. I am just saying that if that's what he did, that's no different from what anyone... Do you, do you get it? Okay, cool. So that was in March. In May, Castro signs the Agrarian Reform Act into law. This is critically important, y'all. This is the turning point. This is the beginning of the turning point at which the United States government starts to turn against Fidel Castro. Not only does the U.S. government start to turn against Castro at this point, but some of the members of his own so-called revolution begin to turn against him. Some of his supporters begin to turn against him because of what they see he began to do with Cuba's resources. The Agrarian Reform Act of 1959 took over 1,000 acres of farmland away from mostly private U.S. interests. Remember yesterday, I told you that uh, sugar, that land that was used to, uh, to plant and harvest sugar, 40% of it, I think, was owned by U.S. interests. All of the cattle ranches in Cuba were owned by U.S. interests. Tobacco farms owned by U.S. interests. And Cuban people were either tenant farmers or sharecroppers on this land. 
So <laughs> I know y'all love that. I'm so glad you love that because you get why this is important, right? Fidel Castro overthrows a corrupt government that was allowing the American mob and the United States government and private interests to come into Cuba and make billions of dollars off of Cuban uh, uh, produce, products, and labor and did not pay the Cuban people fairly for the profits they created. Fidel Castro comes in and says, nope, that's going to stop. <laughs> so he seizes a thousand acres of land from U.S. Uh, uh, from U.S. interests. He abolished large-scale land-owning operations, where no person and no entity could own a thousand acres of land. Remember the wealthy landowners I told you about? I, I have not gotten to the part where all all of the wealthy landowners left because a lot of them hadn't left yet. A lot of them were still waiting to see what Castro would do. Hey, Letitia. A lot of them were sitting around waiting to see what Castro would do because they, they were fully expecting con to continue to make the kind of profits and to have uh, maintain the kind of life and lifestyle in Cuba that they enjoy. They, they really thought that they would. Um, so... Uh, the Agrarian Reform Act of 1959 uh, made, it, uh, made it illegal for a person, a family, or an entity to own more than uh, uh, 993 acres of land, confiscated the land of over 4,000 plantations. There were 4,400 plantations in Cuba that were employing isn't even the right word because these people were not employed. There were sharecroppers and there were tenant farmers and they were basically wait, working for scraps and the, the shack roof over their heads. And the people they worked for, the, the plantation owners they worked for, made all of the profit and did not share that profit with those people. The Agrarian Reform Act of 1959 eliminated that to the point that the land that was confiscated from these plantations, a third of it was distributed to the tenant farmers and the sharecroppers who worked the land. Now this is, here's a little bit of an aside and I'm, I'm gonna try not to take too much time up with this one. But when black people talk about reparations, part of the reparations we are talking about is land ownership because it was ownership of land that gave people rights in this country. And we all know how the plantation system worked in this country and around the world. And after the plantation system that employed slavery was made illegal, then tenant farming and sharecropping replaced it, where you had poor black people and poor white people too, yes, who worked land that wealthy landowners had and made all of the profit off of and we got what scraps and uh, a crappy uh, tin roof shack over our heads so when we're talking about reparations this is the kind of thing we're talking about reparations is basically what fidel castro implemented in cuba January, February, March, April, May, what's that? Five months after he took over the government. So now, do, do you see why people freak out when black people talk about reparations? There's, there's a historical basis. And, 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 and let me just say, the argument against reparations has nothing to do with people not knowing what reparations we're talking about. They know because it's been done by Fidel Castro. They don't want to do it. So, okay, let's get back to this. Uh, the Agrarian Reform Act of 1959, uh, a third of the land was confiscated, confiscated, redistributed to the tenant farmers and the sharecroppers who were working on the land. And in case you think that Fidel Castro just took stuff 
from landowners, he actually offered compensation to the former owners uh, based on the appraised value of the land and a payment with 20 year bonds. So the former owners of the land didn't actually lose, they, they were offered compensation. 993 acres. Thank you, Letitia. You're right. Yeah, I mean, so this was not a, 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 a situation where Fidel Castro goes in and just steals a bunch of stuff and, and kicks people out of the country. That's not what he did. He offered compensation to the previous landowners. And it seems to me like it was fair compensation. Oh, what did he do with the rest of the land outside of the one-third that he redistributed to the uh, tenant farmers, former tenant farmers and sharecroppers. Well, he established state managed farms and cooperatives with the rest. So it seems like a win-win for everybody, right? Right? Yeah. Some people see it that way. Uh, in July, July 26th, 1959. This is all in one year. Not even done with the whole year. Oh, thank you. That's a great point. Thank you, Abdus. Uh, to prove how committed he was to this notion of, uh, uh, of, of a fair and just society, Fidel Castro came from a wealthy family, he and his brother. Their parents were landowners. So in order to prove how committed he was, he took land that he inherited from his father and he gave some of it away in accordance with the law that he just created. I think that's an important point to make uh, when we're talking about a leader who's supposed to be a tyrant, who's supposed to be an awful, awful dictator, but he, some, he, he practiced what he preached and nobody ever brings that up. I think that's important uh, for us to say. So on July 26th at a, a, an historic and monumentous rally in Havana where there were over 1 million people in Havana. Uh, Fidel Castro uh, explains, he, he, he does this great sp speech and he explains to the people the Agrarian Reform Act. Tens of thousands of peasants who lived up in the mountains. Now remember, Havana was the playground of wealthy Americans and the American Mafia. So for a, a bunch of peasants, a bunch of poor people who lived up in the mountains to be able to come into Havana, that was monumentous because remember again, under Batista, very strict uh, uh, racial and caste system segregation, especially in the larger cities, especially in Havana. So on July 26th, hey James, how are you doing? On July 26th, tens of thousands of peasants come down from the uh, surrounding small towns in the mountains into Havana in this great big rally with millions of people. And at this rally, middle class and some wealthy Cubans who were still there put a lot of the peasants up in their homes, see? Not everybody had run away yet. Not all the rich people had run out of Cuba yet. But after this rally, <laughs> because here Castro tells over 1 million Cubans that the revolution would eliminate the class system among Cubans. Here is where moderate Cuban revolutionaries, the moderate supporters of, of uh, uh, Castro, began to lose their, the, the, the rose began to lose, lose its bloom with these people as far as Castro was concerned. Because he just brought all these poor people into Havana after, you know, passing a law that gave them a bunch of land that they worked for practically nothing from some of these wealthy people. And he's just telling all of the middle class and the wealthy people who are left in, 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 in Havana, Guess what? We're all going to be on the same footing in this country from now on. 
There's no, there's not going to be any more rich Cubans, middle class Cubans, poor Cubans. We're all Cubans. And we're all going to share in the wealth of Cuba equally. Just imagine how some people who have amassed their wealth off of the cheap labor of poor people, off of the exploitation of poor people, and have been able to pass that wealth down through generations, this family wealth, this old Cuban money from plantations and cattle farms. Imagine how those people would feel when they heard that they're going to have to share all their stuff and they're not going to be any better off financially and they're certainly not better people than the lowest peasant in Cuba. You don't have to imagine how they felt because by this time, uh, this, is at, this is the point at which a lot of Cuban wealthy and middle class people began to leave. Uh, in the first two years, of Fidel Castro's uh, reign, the first two years now, over two million Cubans left the country. Most of those people were uh, wealthy and well-educated. They were businessmen. I shouldn't say well-educated, I'm sorry. They were wealthy and they were businessmen. They were, many of them were doctors and teachers also because they made a lot of money and they didn't like that there would be no class system anymore. So at this point in July now of 1959, the United States is still supporting Fidel Castro, sorta, kinda, almost, a little bit. They don't like what he just did with the Agrarian Reform Act, but he's offered to pay U.S. interests for what they've lost. So they're like, all right, we're not going to make that big of a deal about it. All right. Until <laughs> members of Castro's own cabinet and some of the people who crafted or helped pass the Agrarian Reform Act. By the way, that was a piece of legislation that was, was passed by a voting body. It wasn't like Fidel Castro strolled into uh, the presidential palace and said, this is what we're going to do. No, several people worked on the piece of legislation. It was presented to governing bodies. They voted on it and it passed. They agreed upon it. Okay. So, but some of these people realizing now that Fidel Castro is dead serious about there not being an upper class and a middle class. and a, They began to turn against him. They say that it was because of the, these growing communist sentiments in the, the Castro cabinet. But I call BS on that. And, and here is where my opinion does sort of come in, but it's based in historical fact. Because, like I said, the United States government has always known that Castro uh, had some communist leanings. There was talk in the Castro camp about his brother being more favorable toward communism than Castro was. They all knew this. What they didn't like was losing their position in society because they figured if we are supposed to be the people who run the government, we ought to have more than the peasants. And they didn't like the fact that under Castro, they weren't going to. So they began to turn on him. Now that's just kind of human nature, right? I have to log back into my system again because I'm talking to y'all so much that I let my uh, screen <laughs> go to sleep. And I have to make sure that I get to my sources because there are a couple of things I want to point out from there. So uh, in, in October of 1959, uh, Pedro Luis Diaz, the former chief of Castro's Air Force, immigrated to the United States. Um, again, it is worth noting that there were people leaving Cuba, turning against Castro, um, going to the United States, 
And Castro didn't kill these people. He basically let them leave. Now, there was a point at which he had to put his foot, foot down and uh, he had to protect himself, his government, and his revolution. All right. So, well, oh, what was this? Oh, need to find it again. I'll go. Okay. I'm sorry. That's something else. Um, so, in October 1959, Pedro Luis Diaz uh, immigrates to the United States. He flies a B-2 bomber over Cuba, dropping leaflets, telling uh, uh, the Cuban people to turn against Castro because of growing communism in his administration. Here's my one question about that. Where did he get a B-2 bomber? <laughs> in October... Uh, also, several of Castro's military officers, including uh, uh, Huber M Mateo, Matos, I'm sorry, uh, who was one of the crafters of the Agrarian Reform Act, uh, resigned their high-ranking posts and claimed that they did it because of growing communism in the, in the Castro administration. Again, I call BS on that. They were just mad that they weren't going to stay rich. Uh, in December, um, Huber Matos is tried, found guilty of treason and conspiracy, and sentenced to 20 years in prison. This is December 1959. That's how quickly people in Cuba, in Castro's revolution, in his administration, turned on him because they weren't going to stay rich. They weren't going to get rich by being members of his cabinet. They cited communism as the reason, but everybody knew that the Castros had communist leanings. But they did that in order to curry favor with the United States who quickly created a plan to scoop up all of these exiles from Cuba and use them to try to overthrow Fidel Castro's government. And they were doing this as early as July of 1959. Think about that. Cuba... Uh, uh, Castro overthrew the Batista government in January of 1959. January 1st. By July or August, the American government was already trying to kill him. Why? If you believe it had anything to do with communism, you know little about history. And I, I don't like to... to I, I don't like to make fun of people's intelligence. This had nothing to do with communism. It had everything to do with U.S. interests losing their ability to continue to make billions of dollars off of almost forced cheap Cuban labor and wealthy Cubans not being able to maintain their uh, social and economic standing in Cuba. That's what this was about. I think it's worth noting that as evil a dictator as Fidel Castro was supposed to be, when uh, Huber Matos was uh, found guilty of treason and conspiracy, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. He wasn't shot. He served every single day of that 20 years though. And this is the other turning point at which whatever moderates were left in Cuba, they turned on Castro. But again, as we pointed out before, every government takes steps to protect itself. And we have treason uh, 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 punishments in this country that include imprisonment for life and up to execution. So how is what Fidel Castro did to people who committed treason and conspiracy against his government any worse than what we do to this day? How is it? But this is something our media, 
will never tell you. Hey, Ben. No, thank you very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Please share this video. So, we're at the end of 1959. <laughs> now we're in 1960. Things don't get better for Fidel Castro. All right? In February of 1960, Cuba uh, expands trade with Russia. Then it was called the USSR. Russia agrees to buy 5 million tons of sugar over five years and supply uh, uh, oil and grain to Cuba. Why is this important? Because see, when Cuba took over uh, the, the, the land that U.S. interests owned, U.S. companies could have continued to operate in Cuba. Instead, they got mad that they were going to have to pay taxes that they weren't paying before to the Cuban government that were going to go to the Cuban people. And they got mad that the profits were not going completely to them. So they left. So Cuba now had, uh, all, they, they didn't have the means to, uh, 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 they had all of this, uh, all these products they were producing and they didn't have anybody to sell it to because the United States at this point was, was like, no, we're not buying anything from you because you're not letting us make unlimited amounts of money off of your cheap labor. So, so Russia steps in and says, oh, will you have all this sugar that you're producing? We like sugar. So we'll buy your sugar from you. It, it wasn't a situation where Russia came in and said, we hate the United States, so we will come in and make them look bad. No, Russia said, you have sugar, you have something we want, we have money, we'll buy what you have. Of course, it was a political move on Russia's part because they understood the geographic location of where Cuba is. But how do you think you make alliances in politics? You don't do it by playing nice. You don't do it because you like people, sometimes. You do it by one hand washes the other. What do you have that I need? What do I have that you need? Let's see if we can make a deal. I'm fully convinced that the Soviet, uh, 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 the Russians didn't care about the cu Cuban people. I'm convinced they didn't. But they did pick up the slack where the United States left it because the U.S. was mad that they couldn't just make billions of dollars off of cheap Cuban labor. So the fact that, that Russia was ever involved in Cuba, entirely our fault. And again, like I said yesterday, John F. Kennedy admitted as much in his speak in, speech in 1960. So here we are in February 1960. By the way, that speak, that speech that John F. Kennedy uh, gave, I think, was in uh, December of 1960. So this was not a mystery about why Cuba got involved in a relationship with Russia. Everybody knew it was because the United States began to turn its back on, on, on Cuba. So... In uh, June, U.S. refineries, oh, I'm sorry, in February, Cuba uh, expands trade with Russia. Russia agrees to buy 5 million tons of sugar over five years, supply oil and grain. At that point, the United States had agreed to buy 7 million pounds of sugar from Cuba because the United States was mad at Cuba for getting into a deal with Russia. The United States rescinded its deal to buy sugar from Cuba. That's another reason that Cuba had to enter into a deal with Russia. And the United States was also pressuring other countries not to trade with Cuba. Uh, in March of 1960, the U.S. imposes trade restrictions on Cuba, retaliation for Cuba's deal with Russia, uh, to not trade with Cuba except for medical supplies and food. Uh, Cuba had ended the U.S.'s ability to make unlimited profits 
And like I said, U.S. companies could have stayed in Cuba and continued to operate. They just would have had to pay the people who were doing the work and pay taxes to the Cuban government. They didn't want to. So here we are in March of 1960. And the U.S. Uh, government approves the anti-Castro plan. <laughs> this is amusing to me because uh, in, let's see, in April of 1959, after Castro overthrew Batista, Castro actually visited the United States. He came here to the United States, and he was met with a hero's welcome in April of 1959. The United States knew then that there was some talk about, oh, I think Castro is kind of communist a little bit, sort of, but they didn't care because he got rid of Batista. So now here we are, March of 1960. Uh, a year later, and the United States government has approved, under uh, President Eisenhower, has approved the anti-Castro plan. This plan includes a complete embargo against Cuba uh, to uh, not export uh, sugar, oil, or gas, uh, and that's uh, or, or guns, I'm sorry, to Cuba. And that's interesting, after the United States government sent guns to the Batista government for seven years and helped Batista murder 20,000 Cubans. Oh, now all of a sudden we can't send guns to Castro because he has communist leanings. Get the heck out of here. <laughs> the anti-Castro plan formalized for the first time, I think, the plan to disseminate anti-Castro propaganda in the United States and in Cuba. Formalized a plan to train Cuban exiles to attack, overthrow, or kill Fidel Castro. All of those people who left Cuba, the United States government approved a plan <laughs> that the CIA would identify those people and train them to use them to invade Cuba and kill Fidel Castro one year after Castro was met with a hero's welcome when he visited the United States. Why? Because of communism? Because of Russia? No, folks. Because of money. Because Fidel Castro ended the ability of the United States government, United States private companies like ITT, and the American mafia from profiting off of the cheap labor of Cuba. In June, uh, oil ref U.S. refineries were still operating in Cuba. It was June of 1960. But because Americans had this ridiculous communism thing, this hatred of Russia, when Russia began uh, importing oil to Cuba or exporting oil to Cuba, the American-run refineries refused to refine the oil <laughs> for Cuba. So what did Castro do? He seized the American refineries. See, at this point, at this point, the American companies are denying services and goods to the Cuban people for political reasons. And at this point, Castro's like, you know what? All bets are off. I didn't seize your companies. I let you stay here. I, I compensated the, 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 the landowners for the land that we nationalized. I was fair about it. But, but now you're mad because... I, I'm, I'm, I'm importing resources from another country that you don't like in order to provide for my people. And you're so mad that you're just not going to refine the oil. Guess what? 
your companies belong to me now. And it's at that point in June of 1960 that Fidel Castro seized the oil refineries of the Texaco Company, Esso, and Shell Oil because they refused to refine oil that came from Russia. In response to this, there was this back and forth between uh, uh, Russia and the United States and, and Cuba. Um, there was, let, let me see if I can, I can, because it's very, very interesting, all of the things that were done. Um, June 7th, U.S. oil companies in Cuba refused to refine Soviet oil. Within the next month, Texaco, Esso, and Shell are nationalized, seized by Castro. Uh, then, uh, in, on, on uh, July um, 6th, President Eisenhower cancels 700,000 tons of sugar remaining in Cuba sugar that the United States said we're not buying the sugar that we, we said we were going to buy. Um, July 8th, the Soviet Union announces that it will purchase the sugar that the United States said it was it wouldn't purchase. Um, September 17th, Cuba nationalizes all U.S. banks, including First National City Bank of New York, First National Bank of Boston, and Chase Manhattan Bank. All of these banks had branches in Cuba and they were doing business with U.S. interests that were again for the 50 millionth time profiting off of the cheap labor of the Cuban people. And because U.S. companies didn't want to pay their fair share, Fidel Castro said, okay, fine, we'll just take your stuff. This is why the United States hates Fidel Castro. It's not because he's some murderous monster. Now, I know I'm running out of time <laughs> because there is so much to continue to discuss. But I am not saying that Fidel Castro was a saint because he did do some terrible things. Um, let me see if I can find it in my notes here because I, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, in between February and April of 1961, several pro-Batista or anti-Castro groups did operate inside of Cuba and tried to overthrow the revolutionary government, tried to ask, uh, oust Castro, and tried to kill him. So during this time, between February and April of 1961, Fidel Castro's government did capture and uh, jail 500 members of the Cuban resistance. And the anti-Batista sentiment among the people was so incredibly high that people actually uh, favored death by firing squad. A, a rallying cry of, of some of Castro's supporters was take them to the wall. There was this wall outside of uh, I think one of the prisons where Castro's army would take members of the resistance uh, or of the pro Batista forces and line them up against the wall and shoot them. So does that mean it was right? No, that doesn't mean it was right. I'm just giving you the historical context for why that happened. There were definitely some uh, so, some uh, some abuses, of course there were. Of course there were. When you oppress people for any period of time and you make them feel like left, less than nothing and they get a chance to strike back, I, all bets are off. That, by the way, is one of the things that people are so terrified of here in the United States. I know, that's a subject for another day. Touchy, touchy, hot, hot. But yeah, um, Fidel Castro, absolutely no saint. But does it really make sense to you <laughs> that this man is now excoriated as one of the most evil dictators on the face of the earth, an enemy of, of, of freedom 
by our press when he was never really given a chance to do for the Cuban people what he really wanted to do without American inter interference? April 15th, 1961. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion. I do have to get to this. And then tomorrow, I'm going to talk about why the Cuban Revolution is important to revolutionaries around the world, but especially to black revolutionaries. All right, so part three is tomorrow. Uh, January 28th, 1961, the United States approves the CIA plan to train 1,200 Cuban exiles to get them to invade Cuba and overthrow Fidel Castro. The president who approved this is President John F. Kennedy. <laughs> April 15th, President Kennedy launches eight B-52 bombers to destroy Cuba's air force. Three major air bases in Cuba are bombed in the first wave. The second wave is inexplicably canceled. April 17th, 1961, CIA trained Cuban exiles do land at the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. The invasion lasts three days but the exile force is defeated by Castro, by his military. Castro orders, now here is one of those instances where people will point to and say, see, Castro was a monster. But consider everything else I just told you. Castro's government orders that dynamite be placed under the cells in prisons to warn people against helping the Bay of Pigs invasion collaborators and U.S. spies, of which there were many at this point. Uh, that also put the fear of families who had people in prison from collaborating with uh, American uh, forces against Castro. Yeah, that was, that was brutal, yes. I'm not even going to make an excuse for that. I'm just saying you, the context makes a little bit more sense now. Not a great thing to do, but context means something. April 19th, Castro publicly declares finally that the revolution is a socialist revolution and Cuba is a socialist country. Well, now the U.S. just knows they hate Cuba and they hate Castro. <laughs> now they can come right out and say it because damn it, he's a socialist. Evil commie socialist. Former revolution members, some of whom helped draft or who approved the Agrarian Reform Act, uh, were executed for treason when they spoke out against Castro. I'm just telling you what happened. I have no opinion on, on whether that was right or wrong. I'm just saying it wasn't about communism. It wasn't about socialism. It was about money money, power, and status, and people being pissed off that they weren't going to have more of any of that than the little people in Cuba. November 30th, now we're at the end of 1961, two years. Fidel Castro has been the head of the Cuban government, two years. November 30th, John F. Kennedy approves Operation Mongoose. What is Operation Mongoose? Operation Mongoose was run by John F. Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General uh, of the Kennedy admini Administration. And Robert Kennedy made overthrowing Fidel Castro the top priority of the United States government to the point that Robert Kennedy said, my idea is to stir things up on the island with espionage, sabotage, general disorder, run and operated by Cubans themselves with every group but Batistaites and communists 
That's really bad. When you hate a guy because he's supposedly a communist, but you don't want to work with communists because you hate communists so much. I don't. Huh. Do not know if we will be successful in overthrowing Castro, but we have nothing to lose in my estimate. This is a quote from Robert F. Kennedy. 1961 notes that he scribbled at a White House meeting in November 1961. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy made it the absolute highest priority of the United States government to get rid of Fidel Castro. If you think that was about communism when there was no communist rule in Cuba at the time, Robert F. Kennedy used the CIA, which had been trying to kill Castro since the summer of 1960 to spearhead Operation Mongoose. The CIA turned around and enlisted the mob. I'm, I'm not making this up. As I did the research, I was actually laughing at how, on the one hand, absolutely ridiculous this is this hatred of this man at this point and how absolutely sinister this is that the most powerful government on the planet didn't hesitate to mobilize the entire weight of the government to get rid of one man. And all he had done at this point was nationalized resources in his country and made it hard for this country to make free money off of those people. So the CIA enlisted the mafia, the mob, La Cosa Nostra, to kill Castro. And of course, they were all up for it because he kicked them out of Cuba too. Remember I told you yesterday about that scene in The Godfather 2? One of our favorites series of movies. We love that movie. Love them. That scene where the Corleone family is in Havana and they're at this meeting of all of the, the mob bosses. Did you know that actually happened? Now, of course, um, you're not going to find like a website of mob history that's going to be legitimate because, you know, they don't really exist. But in, I think it was 1946, there actually was a Havana convention. And there's another scene in The Godfather where all of the uh, um, heads of different industries meet in Havana. That is a nod to the 1946 Havana conference that the mob held in Havana, Cuba. Most of the casinos were run and operated by the mob in Havana. The bordellos were run and operated by the mob. Cuban women and children and men were sexually exploited for profit, for the, the tastes and the whims of wealthy Americans and wealthy people from other countries. So, of course, when the CIA called the mob, they were happy to help them kill the guy who shut off their money pipeline from Cuba. But, <clears throat> excuse me, as we know, uh, oh, and here's one other little point and I'm gonna end with this. Uh, CIA director Richard Helms spent, this was in 1961, y'all. This was in 1961. CIA director Richard Helms spent $100 million dollars to establish a spy base in Miami to overthrow Fidel Castro. $100 million in 1961 money to overthrow a revolutionary leader who up to that point, all he'd really done was work to create an equal society for all people in Cuba. 
and kick the people who were raping Cuba and the Cuban people out of Cuba. That's all he did. Protect his own interests? Yes. Protected his government from those on the inside who would work against him to destroy what he was trying to create? Yes, he did. Absolutely. Some of those methods were absolutely brutal. The firing squads, brutal, disgusting. Yes. I am just asking you to consider what the United States has done and continues to justify that we do in the name of national security. How is what he did any different? If we're going to make what we do okay, how is he an enemy of freedom, justice in the United States when he has done nowhere near, up to this point, the kinds of things we've done? As much as our media continues to excoriate and demonize Fidel Castro, we still pay the Cuban government for the land that we run Guantanamo Bay on. We have a perpetual lease with the government of Cuba for that naval base where we house and torture and kill people we consider enemy combatants in this war on terror. We pay Cuba for that land. And our media and our politicians have the nerve to talk about what a brutal tyrant Fidel Castro is or was. So I hope this discussion gives you a little bit more of a perspective on what actually happened with the Cuban Revolution. What role the United States government actually played. And what I said to you, what I told you tonight, it's not even everything. It's not, it's not everything. It's not everything good. It's not everything bad. We don't have that much time. So I am going to provide the links to you, like I said. And, and I hope you read them all. And I, I hope you research further. And I hope you tune in tomorrow night at around the same time. Because tomorrow night, oh, we're getting to the good stuff tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about why Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, because they work together. Why what they did is so important to revolutionaries around the world. Why what they did and how they did it is a blueprint and a lesson for us today and why Fidel Castro is loved in African nations around the world, especially. I have talked enough. I hope you guys learned a thing or two. I really do. And I hope you enjoyed tuning in. Please check us out, Real Progressives, Check us out on YouTube. Check our webpage out, Real Progressives USA. Check me and my husband out over at Coffee Current Events and Politics. Um, please like our page. Please subscribe to our YouTube page. I am sure somebody else is going to be live streaming tonight on, uh, on our Real Progressives page. So please stay tuned uh, for the live notification and join us again later on tonight and tomorrow and every day at We're Real Progressives. Share our stuff. Thank you so much for watching. This is Jackie Lukeman. Did I just say washing? I've talked too much. Thank you for watching. This is Jackie Lukeman from Washington, D.C. Have a great night.